Here we will be discussing a set of rules that will allow us to predict whether a specific ionic compound is soluble in water. Before we do that, we have a couple of definitions that we need to discuss. A strong electrolyte solution is a solution where ions are present. And an electrolyte is a substance that dissolves in water and gives a solution that conducts electricity. So water without an electrolyte actually does not conduct very well. And it's when you dissolve an electrolyte, something that gives ions when it dissolves in water, that water actually can conduct electricity. A classic example is NaCl, which is common table salt. NaCl dissolves in water to give a strong electrolyte solution. And when it does that, it disassociates into solvated Na plus ions and solvated Cl minus ions. And that's represented here that we're taking solid sodium chloride and dissolving it. And once it's dissolved, the ions are solvated. And that's why we use the subscript AQ. That's the state of Na plus and Cl minus is that they are dissolved in water. A non-electrolyte solution involves a solute that does not ionize. So a classic example of this is sugar. When we take sugar solid and dissolve it in water, the sugar is dissolved and it becomes an aqueous solution. However, ions are not formed. So when we dissolve sugar in water, this is considered a non-electrolyte solution. So when we mean soluble compounds, we really are discussing in this case whether something is soluble in water. So there is many different solvents but for this section, we are talking about solubility in water. And if an ionic compound is deemed to be soluble in water, it means that it disassociates virtually completely when it's added to water. And once again, NaCl is a classic example of that. Soluble means that if we were to put NaCl in water, this reaction that we show here, the disassociation into the corresponding ions, lies completely to the right. That means in an unsaturated solution, very little of NaCl solid is going to be present. However, Na plus and Cl minus will be present. So when we add NaCl solid, almost all of it disassociates completely into the ionic forms. However, we can have ionic species that are considered insoluble in water. And that means the ionic compound does not disassociate when we put it into water. Here we have an example AgCl solid, which we will find out is considered insoluble in water. Although it can disassociate into its ionic species, insoluble means that this reaction lies almost completely to the left. So when we add AgCl to water, very little of it disassociates into Ag plus and Cl minus. So this disassociation is virtually invisible to our eye. When we add AgCl to water, it will seem like none of it is dissolving. Although this is not 100% true, some of it will dissolve, and we will talk about this later when we discuss solubility products, but we expect very little of the ions, Ag plus and Cl minus, to be present inside of our aqueous solution. So here are some basic rules for solubility, and these change depending on which textbook you're looking at. So you want to make sure that you learn the solubility rules for whatever course that you are taking. And the idea is you follow these rules in order. So you start with rule one, and if it doesn't apply, then you go on to rule two, and so forth. The first rule says that compounds containing alkali metals, which are group one, all the way to the left in the periodic table, such as Na plus and K plus, are soluble. So a salt that involves a group one metal, like sodium phosphate or potassium cyanide, I would expect them to be soluble in water. Another part of rule one is that if I make a ionic compound using the ammonium ion, NH4+, these are going to be expected to be soluble. So an example of this is ammonium chloride. I would expect this ionic species to be soluble in water. Lastly, compounds that contain nitrates, NO3-, minus, and acetates, C2H3O2-, minus, are considered soluble. So here, like iron 2 nitrate or calcium acetate, we would expect them to be soluble in water. So I will say rule one is kind of important, and if you can remember these basic ideas in rule one, this will get you through quite a bit of the solubility that you need to know. Group one metals, ammonium and nitrates are soluble, is going to allow you to mostly understand the solubility rules that you need to use for general chemistry.
So if I look and I have an ion a compound and I cannot tell if it is soluble from rule one, then I go on to rule two. Rule two says chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble except for those using lead two plus, mercury two plus, and silver plus. So some examples here, iron two chloride, I would expect to be soluble. So chlorides are soluble. AgCl, on the other hand, as we just saw, is insoluble. So here, chloride, bromide, and iodide salts of Ag plus tend to be insoluble. So AgCl is expected to be insoluble. Rule three says that sulfates are soluble, except for strontium two plus, barium two plus, lead two plus, silver plus, and calcium two plus. Some examples here, nickel two sulfate is considered to be soluble. So it is a sulfate, but is not one of these exceptions to the solubility rule. Calcium sulfate, on the other hand, is insoluble. Even though it is a sulfate, sulfates of calcium 2 plus are expected to be insoluble. Rule four says that carbonates and phosphates are insoluble, except those listed in rule one. So rule one dominates. So unless the ionic salt is applied to rule one, carbonates and phosphates tend to be insoluble. So calcium carbonate is insoluble. However, sodium carbonate is soluble because sodium carbonate is attached to a group one metal and a group one metal is mentioned in rule one. Lastly, hydroxides and sulfides are considered insoluble, once again, except for those listed as being soluble in rule one. Here, iron two sulfide is insoluble. So it's a sulfide. F iron is not mentioned, is in, rule not mentioned one, in rule so one, iron so iron sulfide is, sulfide is insoluble. However, potassium sulfide is soluble because potassium is mentioned in rule one as a group one metal. So let's look at some more examples. One of your main skills that you want to use is to be able to tell if a given salt is going to be soluble in water or not. So the first one, sodium hydroxide, I know that this is going to be soluble because sodium is mentioned in rule one. So once again, you start with rule one, see if that applies, and then you continue on. So here, nickel two hydroxide, once again, I start the rule one. Rule one does not mention nickel or hydroxide. And here, when we get down to it, the rule that will actually apply says that hydroxides and sulfides are insoluble, except for those listed as soluble in rule one. Because nickel is not mentioned in rule one, and we know that hydroxides are insoluble. We know that nickel two hydroxide is insoluble. The next one, calcium phosphate. The rule that's going to be applied here is rule four. So we always wanna check rule one and make sure that rule one does not apply. In this case, it doesn't. Rule four says that carbonates and phosphates are insoluble, except for those listed in rule one. Here, calcium is not mentioned in rule one. And then rule four says that phosphates tend to be insoluble. Lastly, iron two sulfate. The rule here that's going to be applied is rule three. Once again, you want to start with rule one and see if that applies. And then if not, then you continue down the rules until you get to a rule that applies. Here, rule three says that sulfates are soluble except for those attached to strontium, barium, lead, silver, and calcium. And in this case, iron two plus is not mentioned as an exception. Sulfates tend to be soluble, so iron 2 sulfate is soluble based off of rule number three.